Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David German, chair of the New York Carolina Club. Welcome to our seventh Tommy Kearns New York Carolina Club online basketball speaker series event. This basketball speaker series is named in honor of Tommy Kearns, class of 1958 and member of the undefeated UNC 1957 National Championship basketball team. Tommy has been a tremendous supporter of the New York Carolina Club for many years. And we're proud to have this speaker series named after him. Before I introduce our guest speaker and interviewer, I want to thank several people who've been instrumental in setting up our event. A special thanks goes to ESPN senior publicist Colin Bradley for his work in arranging the interview, along with Carolina Alumni Coordinator of Alumni Clubs, Trey Wilson, and New York Carolina Club Board of Trustees members, Nicholas Baffia and Brian Joyner, all whose efforts have been instrumental in making this event happen. This afternoon, we are delighted to have with us the highly respected and accomplished broadcaster, Wes Durham. The son of the 40-year voice of the Tar Heels, Woody Durham, whom the New York Carolina Club had the fortune of having as a previous annual fall cocktail reception honoree, Wes has been around college sports and the ACC his entire life. He calls college football and basketball games on ESPN platforms, in addition to contributing to ACC Network studio shows. Whenever someone turns on a sporting event and discovers that Wes is doing the play-by-play, -play, they know they will be treated to a highly informative and enjoyable broadcast. His well-documented accomplishments are many, and there was no one more suited to do the Rivals Reunited interview than him. Wes, we appreciate you enormously taking the time and miss your busy broadcast schedule for being here this afternoon. We are once again delighted that hosting the discussion is Larry Keith, UNC class of 1969. Larry grew up in Charlotte and spent 50 years in New York, 35 of those at Sports Illustrated and Time Inc. In his Sports Illustrated career, he was a reporter, writer, senior editor, assistant managing editor, and editorial projects director. Enshrined in the North Carolina Journalism Hall of Fame, Larry is a former member of the New York Carolina Club Board of Trustees, the UNC General Alumni Association Alumni Board, and the UNC School of Media and Journalism's Board of Advisors. The New York Carolina Club thanks Wes and Larry for taking part in this online event. So let us begin, and I now introduce to you Larry Keith. Thank you very much, David. And uh, Wes, delightful to be uh, doing this with you. I, I mentioned uh, before we came on that I've seen the program four times now preparing for this interview. And it's, it's outstanding. And uh, we should note, of course, that it will be on the air on uh, the ACC Network, hmm. uh, Wednesday, February 28th at 9 p.m. following, I think you said, a Duke-Louisville game. Yeah, Duke and Louisville are playing at Cameron uh, next Wednesday night, and um, the game's at 7 o'clock. So I'd say, you know, there's a chance it airs at 9.03, 9.05, There's a lot of fouls in the second half, and the game's <laughs> close, maybe 9.20. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, we've gotten college basketball to about a two-hour and seven-minute window. We haven't been able to get it to sub-two hours very much in this world we're living in now, but – uh, two oh seven is typically about the time. So as soon as that game is over, they'll uh, they'll run the program for the first time. Terrific. Uh, and let's talk about the program. What's the backstory? How did it all come together? <laughs> oh gosh, um, this is one of those. It's kind of hard to believe this this was going to happen, and it wasn't going to be televised stories. Um, the interesting part for me is that um, I was approached about a year ago. In fact, it was a year ago last week by a friend of mine named Rob Goodman. And those who have been in North Carolina, you know, recently in the last 20 years, Rob was in sports anchor at WFMY television in, in Greensboro. Uh, he then got into a sports marketing business, principally with NASCAR and some other people. And Rob had had a conversation with Mac Morris, who was the longtime basketball coach at Page High School in Greensboro. Mac had unbelievable players in his career. The most noted, most decorated was Danny Manning, obviously, um, who had played at Page. And so Mac and Phil Weaver, who is the head basketball coach at Grimsley High School in Greensboro, are essentially the caretakers of an organization called the North Carolina Coaches Association. Now, 
you know, when I say North Carolina Coaches Association, people think of, well, okay, that's a high school. That's the North Carolina High School. No, this is the North Carolina Coaches Association. And they are the purveyors of the East-West All-Star Game. Now, if you grew up in North Carolina, you spent any time in the history of North Carolina high school athletics, you know the East-West All-Star Game was originated by Bob Jamison, of course, who was the great athletic director, high school coach, decorated coach at, at Grimsley and Greensboro for many years. In fact, he was there when it was called Greensboro High School, not even Grimsley. But Coach Bob started the North Carolina Coaches Association. Well, it just so happened that 2023 – was going to be the 75th anniversary of the North Carolina Coaches Association, the East-West All-Star Game, and the Coaches Clinic. Well, Mac Morris and Phil Weaver, hoping to uh, play on the emotions of that 75th anniversary, basically had gotten Roy Williams and Mike Krzyzewski to agree to come speak at the 75th anniversary of the North Carolina Coaches Association. Good. And in doing so... Um, they kind of laid out what they wanted to do. And they both said, hey, look, we don't want to stand behind a podium or draw on a whiteboard. We'd rather have a moderated conversation together. And that's where it was kind of left, Larry, in all honesty. Um, and then transpiring off of that, Mac called Rob Goodman and said, Rob, Mike Krzyzewski and Roy Williams have agreed to come to the coaches clinic. And in doing so, uh, they want a moderator. And Mac asked him who – Mike asked – Mac asked Mike Krzyzewski first. Now, this is the part that's going to get the Carolina people kind of scratching their head. <laughs> Mac asked Mike Krzyzewski who he'd like to moderate. And Krzyzewski said, well, get West Durham. And that goes back a few years. Obviously, I'm 11 years into television after 18 years at Georgia Tech. And I got to know Coach K when my television career started a lot better than when I was at Georgia Tech, obviously. But so then uh, Roy likes to add to the joke. I said, well, first time I saw Roy after I agreed to do it and they asked me to do it, I said, by the way, I talked to Mac Morris. I'm excited to do the thing in July. And he said, oh, they asked you? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, I told Mike that'd be fine if that's what Mike wanted to do, but I'd prefer somebody else. Now, he was joking, but – Roy was basically saying, I'm glad they got you to do it. But the truth is that Mike Krzyzewski told Mac Morris, let's get Wes to do it. And Roy had no problem with that. So that's how this all developed. The backstory on the second layer of this, and I'm sorry for the long answer, is Mac Morris called me about three weeks after we agreed to do it and said, hey, you think anybody might want to televise this? And I said, think, I said, I they know thinking I'll guarantee you they want to televise it. So to, to kind of, you know, take all the gray out of a, of, of a business that's got a lot of gray in it right now. Uh, I contacted the people with ESPN projects, the ACC network and said, look, there's this event in July. Uh, it's going to be Roy Williams, Mike Krzyzewski and me. And we're going to talk about an hour and a half in front of, Probably a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 high school coaches from across the state of North Carolina as part of the North Carolina Coach Association. And do you guys want to televise it? Do you, you guys want to tape it and make something out of it? And it quickly ran through the channels of ESPN, the ACC network. And the good part for us is that it ran back to an agreement that ESPN, the ACC network has with Raycom Productions in Charlotte. Raycom, of course, same company had done games for years. And I ended up in meetings with those folks starting in May. Um, Rob Reichley, their executive producer, Jordan uh, Smith, who ended up being our project producer and a terrific staff. And we went to work on how do you, how do you moderate a discussion with Roy Williams and Mike Krzyzewski in 90 minutes that you're going to turn into a one hour show. And we taped it last July, and as I told you before we got started here a moment ago, I saw it the full cut for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I think people are going to enjoy it. I, I'm not one of those guys that said, oh, it's a can't miss and all that, but I will tell you, I think it's informative. I think if you're a Carolina fan, a Duke fan, if you're a coach, if you're a college basketball fan, if you like hearing about leadership, uh, things of that nature, I think you're really going to enjoy these guys talking about their careers and their lives and the two programs they were at the pinnacle of for so many years. 
Uh, that's a that's a long answer, but a great answer. It's great background on how the soup is made. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you have to prepare yourself? Because as you point out, you'd known Coach K for many years. Sure. Uh, so, or did you just know their work so well that it didn't really take a lot of preparation? Well, yeah, and that's that's a really good point about the enormity of it, right? Because you can't – it's like I was fortunate to do a Super Bowl on radio – and I got a great piece of advice a couple of weeks out of the Super Bowl after the NFC Championship by saying, hey, look, you're going to do the biggest game in the Western Hemisphere. It's the biggest sporting event in America, and you're not going to be able to get everything on the piece of paper for the game. So you need to kind of build a fence around what's important. And then if you get to some of the stuff outside the fence, just have working knowledge of, of what's out there. And that's what we had to do here. But in order to do, I think, justice, uh, we had to build – uh, we had to build a process and we had to make one big decision in this. Were we going to do this chronologically and ultimately hit coaching and hit games and hit players and hit all those type things along the way? Or were we just going to take topics and create kind of a semicircle and go left to right and say, okay, our goal is to go from one end of the half moon to the other. And, or are we going to do this in a timeline? And we settled on a timeline in part because we thought it was a more efficient way to use our 90 minutes of what was live done and now that we've reduced into an hour show. So we went chronologically and we started like from the beginning, literally the earth cooled. You, how did you decide you wanted to be a coach? You know, when, when did you know you wanted to be a coach? That's literally, as you've seen it, that's literally the first question of the whole deal. And well, I think we, we started safely – and then the the details and the branches go from there. You called it an incredible moment and a mm. momentous day. You were yeah. truly fired up about this. Oh, yeah. I was fired up because they'd never done it. Yeah. And I knew they'd never done it. And I, I felt like that in some small way, I was representing the hundreds of thousands of ACC basketball fans, let alone Duke and Carolina fans, who would want to sit in a room and ask the questions of two people that have been at the forefront. And then see the thing about Roy is while it was, you know, less than 20 years coaching at Carolina, Roy Williams, ACC history dates back to the, to the guy that grew up in Spruce Pine. Mike Krzyzewski's ACC history is a legit 40 years. I mean, it's his timeline arriving from West point to coach Duke and now his omnipresence in the ACC and certainly with Duke university. For me, I I knew it, it would be like, you know, we lost Lefty Drizel last weekend. If you could put Lefty Drizel, Dean Smith, Norman Sloan, Bones McKinney in the same room for two hours, it was that moment, right? Yeah. And yeah. and as I told Mike and Roy last July, it's the first project that I've really worked on professionally uh, since my dad passed away that I spent a lot of time thinking about okay, what would my dad do here? What would the formulation be like? What would I remember about him building those sit-downs with Dean Smith about, or even with Charlie Justice? I mean, he did a long time, years and years and years ago, he did a sit-down with Charlie Justice, and I remember him doing that film about a Notre Dame game at Yankee Stadium. And as a kid, I remember him building that film. And that's what I found myself doing on this. And in the meetings I'd have with the people at Raycom and the conversations with folks at ESPN, how would, how are we going to do this justice? And how are we going to touch everybody? Because I wanted to certainly touch Carolina fans, Duke fans, all those fans, but I also had this room full of coaches too. Yeah. I had these, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 people that are sitting in the lower bowl of the Greensboro Coliseum who really wanted to eat all this up and all of them had notepads <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, I got to give them stuff that, you know, Roy, and, and here's the last part about this in terms of building it. I also had to be able to take a topic and ask the question quickly because you're not there to hear me. You're there to hear them. How could I say something in a very small fracture sentence and get it out there so they could respond to it. And the other part was to, you wanted to get something to get them going, talking, early to make them feel comfortable about where the day was going to go. Well, that's the essence of good interviewing. So I'll shut up and ask the next question. <laughs> <laughs> what stood out to you? What, what they, did you learn anything about them that you didn't know before? Um, 
Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> Did I find out anything? The answer could be probably not because you knew them so well. Well, I, I, I did find out that, and and I thought this for about the last ten to fifteen years. I, you know, and it's interesting when you grow up a Carolina fan, and I'm guilty as charged, right? I am completely guilty as charged on growing up a Carolina fan. But then I went away professionally and started working at other places and then in 95 came to work at Georgia Tech and stayed 18 years. So I saw Carolina from a different way. And I I think differently now about Carolina than I did as a kid. You know, Um, for me, I have said in the last decade or so, Larry, that I think Duke and Carolina need each other to create Duke and Carolina. Good point. And – when you hear them talk about recruiting, that was something that proved that to me. Because when when you hear Roy Williams and Mike Krzyzewski talk about the player, the characteristics and the players they're looking for to build championship teams, you're going to get a lot of similarities. And, and they refer to it as structured leadership, uh, talent, things of that nature. But it confirmed to me why Duke and Carolina are Duke and Carolina. And it, it shows – I think people are going to find more symmetry in, in Roy and Mike than I think they're – they'll have when the hour starts than they will when it ends. I think they're going to see a lot of symmetry between the two guys. That's a, that's a good point, and that's, that's certainly true. Is there anything that you wished you had asked and, and didn't, or is there anything that was left out in those 30 minutes <laughs> that uh, we would love to hear or see? Uh, some of the 30 minutes that got left out are in the closing credits, which is funny. Yeah. Um, there's some funny stuff in the closing credits, like Roy just fires one right over the bow at me, right? When we start, which is funny. Um, we didn't put it in the original show, but it's in the closing credits. Um, you know, um, I would have liked, oh, sure. I mean, I'm the guy that absolutely would want them to name their five favorite players. I mean, but I wasn't going to do that. I mean, I wasn't going to get into the long drawn out of, well, they're all great. You know, <laughs> um, I would have liked to have, I would have liked to have found out a little bit more. I, I did want coach K to qualify the early years and he did a nice job of that. Um, I don't know that there's anything that we put on the original kind of whiteboard, if you will, of what we were going to do that we didn't ask. Um, Roy answers the one question. I'm not going to spoil this because I, I think it's a really kind of cool piece of the whole deal. Roy Williams tells you the one Duke player he wished he'd had on his team. I mean, you've seen the show, you know that. Yeah. Um, which I think was an interesting answer. Coach K didn't really answer the question, but that's okay too. That's right. Um, I, uh, I hedged a bet with one of our production people on it and I lost $5 there. Um, because I feel pretty confident. I know who it is, but, um, he didn't say it. So I lost the bet. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, um, I, I think we did a pretty good job. I, we didn't get into memorable games very much. Um, which I I'm, I'm sorry to say we didn't pull off. I would have liked to have had the memorable games piece be a little longer. Um, but we ran out of time in the bigger picture too, Larry, we ran out of time you know, in our 90 minute window, to be honest with you. Yeah. You, uh, you started just where you said with their uh, uh, early ambitions as kids. And it was interesting that they were both teenagers when they said they wanted yeah. to be high school coaches. Yeah. I, I thought Roy's revealing the fact that, you know, he wasn't sure he was going to college. Yeah. And um, golly, what a, what a massive miss that would have been, huh? To not have Roy Williams in coaching because <laughs> right. he didn't go to right. college. Uh, I, I think both of their stories are, and I, I would say this, and I watched some other pieces that they had done in kind of preparation for this. And I think both have talked uh, often about their youth and growing up and the influences. So I wanted to make sure that piece got rolled into it. And the fastest way to do it in our, in our time was to do it in a way by talking about when you wanted to coach. Cause yeah. I knew that would lead Roy to buddy Baldwin and I knew it would lead coach k to bob knight and tom butters and and i'll say this and i i i gleaned this in preparation and then he confirmed it for me tom butters is a much bigger figure in mike shashevsky's history at duke university than he gets credit for 
I think, I think Tom Butter's leadership as the athletic director at Duke, because you think about Mike Krzyzewski's first three years, and in today's world, Mike Krzyzewski doesn't survive. He's not Duke's coach in year four. Um, I mean, just look at the modern-day world we're in. And I think Roy, not only – we all know about Buddy Baldwin. We all are understanding of who Buddy Baldwin is. And there's a fun moment in the show about Buddy Baldwin, which yeah. I think is pretty good. Um, but Buddy Baldwin and Dean Smith put Roy Williams on the map. Those two guys. Uh, Coach Smith is obviously the name that most people are familiar with around the world and around the country. But I think the fact that uh, that Buddy Baldwin's influence is also really, really important to who Roy Williams is. Both Roy and 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 Coach K, Mike, used the word, I think, chills. Uh, Mike uh, talking about uh, his athletic director, as you pointed out, and uh, Roy talking about Buddy Baldwin. Uh, so clearly, very early on, these men had meaningful effects on their careers. Yeah, I think that Buddy Baldwin is the one that um... – probably impacted Roy Williams with a mission to get to college and to get into coaching. I think Dean Smith then lifted the rocket off the launch pad. No. I think Buddy Ball, I think Buddy Baldwin got him to the launch pad and I think Dean Smith put the rocket in orbit uh, that, of Roy that's Williams. Right. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. I, I thought that Coach K might didn't really come out four square for Bobby Knight. Yeah. <laughs> Is that yeah, fair? That, well, that's fair. Um, I, I think the relationship did obviously have a Cold War piece to it, right? There was a Cold War between Knight and Kay. Um, it's been written about by several people. Um, I think it's probably more documented. And by the way, you go back and read books on stuff. But when you do something like this, you go back and, and scam through books. And Ian O'Connor's book, which is not a gracious book in some ways, does talk about the Cold War. Yeah. Um, I also think, too, that Coach K's leadership book outlines a little bit more about who he is as a coach and what he learned from, you know, working for Knight and being a head coach at West Point and kind of understanding all those things. And, um, you know, I also think, too, that in many respects, Coach K also alludes to this. Here I am kind of giving you some of the show. Coach K also alludes to the maturity of himself as a head coach and at the end, understanding more about who Dean Smith was when he came oh, into the league yeah. later in his career than he did when he came to Duke in the 80s. And I thought that, too, Larry, was a very interesting thing for me to hear, but I think it'll be equally interesting for folks who maybe have just been caught up so much in Duke, Carolina, in that silo. Yes. But when they hear him talk about Dean Smith and what he learned from Dean Smith – I think that's a that's an interesting and revealing part that that folks are not going to expect either. No, I, I think you're absolutely right, and 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 the way Mike distinguished between his early feelings toward Dean Smith yeah. and his later feelings towards Dean Smith <laughs> revealed a lot about Mike as a coach. Yeah, and I I would also offer you this too. Um, I I knew a little bit about their relationship through some other channels. And I wanted to make sure that I talked about Dean Smith to Mike Krzyzewski because I know what the latter three to five years of Coach Smith's life and Mike Krzyzewski, I know how important that was to him. And Coach Smith and Linnea's relationship with Mickey and Mike and those kind of things. And, um, you know, on a personal note, and I didn't get into this on the show, it's not important to the show, but Mike Krzyzewski's respect to my dad had a lot to do with that. Mike Krzyzewski, when Duke won ACC tournaments and my dad was doing every game of the tournament on the Tar Heel Sports Network, Mike would do the TV interview. He would do Bob Harris, of course, who's his announcer at Duke. And the next announcer he would always talk to was my dad. Yeah. And, in fact, I, I tweet this picture out every once in a while. Um, you know, the, and I talked about it on an ESPN clip that we did – um, back on Coach K's final year, I um, I always respected that. And I have a picture of my dad interviewing Coach K on the floor in Greensboro at my dad's last ACC tournament. Hmm. 
and Robert Crawford and Winston Salem made the picture, and it's an important picture to me. Yeah. Um, but I also knew that my dad's respect with Coach K and vice versa translated when my dad got sick. He got an unbelievable note from Coach K. Um, we got a lovely card of the rosary when my dad passed away from Mike and Mickey. And those are the kind, those are the type of things that that take the rivalry and all the things about it down to a very personal level. And I felt like that with Coach K and Coach Smith and the things I had heard about their relationship in the latter years of Coach Smith's life. And that's why it was important for me to have it in the in the show, I thought. Oh, I, I thought it was a, a great line of questioning. And if I may a quote from Coach K, I'm glad God gave me the opportunity to know Coach mm. Smith yeah. long enough to appreciate him and to develop that friendship. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you hit a bullseye with that. Well, I appreciate it. I, I, you know, again, there were a lot of, there were a lot of people standing on my shoulder, whispering in my ear as we went along there. Um, <laughs> people who were with us and people who aren't with us that I was thinking about during the day and, and making some notes on the final, on the final run of this. So yeah, I feel very fortunate to have, uh, to kind of hit all the notes, I think, as we move through that hour and a half. I, th I thought their approach to the interview was reflected in the way they sat, believe it or not. Coach K sat straight up, very military-like, you know, straight <laughs> up in the chair. Roy was slumped back, had his legs extended. <laughs> he was funnier, I thought. He was more accommodating to Coach K. Yep. Uh, Mike was more instructive and more formal. Yeah, well... And and I, I, I it's funny you mention that because somebody uh, with ESPN said that to me when they saw one of the early clips, and I said, "Well, Roy's been retired longer. He's ready to go. <laughs> He's looser. <laughs> That's Roy, you very know, good. Yeah. Roy's thinking about the next tea time. He's not worried about you know the. I mean, Mike is involved with NBA. I mean, you know, <laughs> who knows? He might be cooking up on the whiteboard what the next All Star game is going to look like. I mean, <laughs> I think you're right. But uh, but Roy is a guy who, and and I think it's reflective in the fact too that in their post careers and you know, Roy likes sitting in the corner. He and Wanda like sitting by the tunnel in the corner. Mike is a rare appearer at Duke games. I One mean, game it's, he did. yeah, right. well, he was at Notre Dame well, last year. He came to LaSalle this year because oh, of his okay, friendship yeah. with Fran Dunphy. And, you know, I, I think I respect that. I think that, you know, he's, he feels a direct connection to John Shire on so many different layers. He's still around the program without being at the games and, I think that's important. I think the the relationship Roy has, and I would say this with Roy and Hubert, I think the relationships are similar, but publicly they're perceived in a couple different lines. And whether that's right or wrong, it really doesn't matter because I think it's only important to the uh, to the current coach how that relationship is uh, is formulated. Uh, that's uh, that's that's a good point. They uh, th they did agree a lot. They were very generous to each other. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that wasn't forced. That seemed natural. It did. Um, and and some of those questions were ones where you kind of knew what you were going to get a little bit. You wanted to see if they would expand. And if they did, great. And if they didn't, then, you know, that's kind of the way you build the diagrams, right, yeah. of when you do stuff like this. We're going to go here. And if they go on into this, then we might be able to touch two or three other things. Um, and I would say that the question we referred to earlier about, uh, when Roy, you know, kind of mentioned the best player, you know, the Duke player he would have liked to have coached, had Coach K gone there, then we might have been able to 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 go another level in that particular area as well. The uh, at, at your urging, they talked about the family values that they tried to build in their mm -hmm. respective programs, and they were both very good on that. Yeah, yeah. I this is the part where you, I think, have to work outside. <laughs> to to understand Duke and Carolina's uh, symbiotic relationship, if you will. Um, I think the Duke brotherhood and the Carolina family are different, but I think there's a lot that's the same. Um, and I've had the good fortune to be uh, working and broadcasting now with former Carolina players and former Duke players. Uh, I've been asked for a uh, conversation with Duke players who want to get into broadcasting, Carolina players that want to get into broadcasting. I know that there are live text chains during games with both. Um, there is an app called, I guess it's called WhatsApp or something like that. My son actually told me about it. 
I know that there is a former WhatsApp conversation with Carolina basketball players during every game. And it's a hundred and ish players. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's now it might be players that just like, I mean, you know, it's not, I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, we got Grubar, Larry Miller and, uh, Lee Dedman and, you know, Rusty Clark on the WhatsApp conversation. We're only dealing with, I think, I think the last 20 years, maybe. Okay. But the Duke conversation also contains a hundred and some guys. Wow. Um, and it's a, it, and I don't want to be on the conversation. Don't want to know who's on it, but I know it exists. And that's a good thing because what that does is it keeps the blood flowing in the program. Oh yeah. And I think there's, you know, I told Kenny Denard this a couple of years ago, and I got to meet Kenny through Mike Jaminski when I first went to television and did a lot of games with G. And I told Kenny Denard this. I think there are teams that set that most that that whole process in motion, right? I think the the Duke Brotherhood goes all the way back to like the 78. And Jim Beheim and I have been fortunate we've done some games here during this particular season. And he talks about the 1960 team with Jack Marin and Bob Verga and Steve Vicendak and Vic Bubis. And he's convinced me how underrated Vic Bubis is as a coach. I think he's right on a lot of fronts there. Um, but I think in the 70s, when that Duke team, Carolina lost to Marquette in 77 in Atlanta at the Omni, Duke lost to Kentucky and Goose Givens in 78 at St. Louis on Indiana's floor. I'll never forget that. Um, I think that's when the modern, if you will, if I can say modern era, and I'm not trying to slight anybody beforehand, but I think that's when the current iteration, even though Dean Smith was coaching Carolina, Bill Foster was coaching Duke, that kind of created the uptick. Yeah, And then the launching pads occurred in the 80s. When we went 82 with Carolina, 83 NC State, 86 Duke playing at Reunion Arena against Louisville, that's the that was the uptick to to what we now know as Duke Carolina. I think in in at least from a national perspective. Yeah, no, it's it's a, the timing is, is good for me. I was in school in the late sixties, and Carolina was dominant. Yep, but Duke was not Duke at that time. No, no, Bubas did a great job, but when Bubas left. And, you know, they, they had those teams with Marin and Vicendak. And, and of course, this is all Bay. I can hear Bayham in my ear now after these conversations because he played those Duke teams. Dave, uh, Jim was playing with Dave Bing for Fred Lewis at Syracuse, and they played at Reynolds and Raleigh. And, you know, he talked about just how lethal those teams were. And, yeah, but Carolina won, what, four straight ACC tournaments in the 60s, right? And they went to Final Fours for sure. Yeah, three. Yeah. Yeah, three. And so, I mean, that was Charlie Scott, and it was Larry Miller, and it was, you know, Grubar and all these great players. And so I, I think that, you know, Dukes, and again, I get the Bubis connection, but K is the one that moved it to the next stratosphere. Just as Carolina's stratosphere, Coach Smith took it into the 90s, and then Roy came back in uh, in 03, the stratosphere was the next level for Carolina too. And that's that's kind of how they've become the bluest of the bloods, I think, in, in college basketball as we look today. Yeah, you. Uh, I, I remember you started that part of the conversation by saying uh, that the elephant in the room was calling Duke Carolina the greatest rivalry in sports. Absolutely. Yeah. I Look, I'm, I'm not unopposed by many in that comment. And I am uh, – I'm one of those guys that believes you have to see it. And I think you have to see it in person. We have so many people there now that digest the rivalry on television. Yeah. I think you got to go to the game. Yeah. And I think you got to go to a regular season game too. I'm one of the guys that tells you the tournament thing doesn't count. You got to go see it in somebody's building. And um, look, they just had the one in Chapel Hill. And I ran into a guy last night in Atlanta whose daughter's a sophomore at Chapel Hill and she got a seat on the risers. And he was more excited than she was. <laughs> and she had been a part of the game. And and I believe in sport, it is the one it, that delivers the most. I think it's the one that's got compelling storylines for the last 25 years, maybe even longer. I think 30 odd years now, to be honest. Um, you know, and that's, that's what makes the thing special. And look, ESPN knows it. I mean, they're not, they're not playing around with it. That's why the yeah. game's in February. I mean, that's why it's after the Super Bowl every year. And, uh, <laughs> And I believe it to be still the uh, – I think it'll be the most watched regular season college basketball game on ESPN again this year. 
and it's, uh, you know, it's probably close to the top 10 for the last 20 consecutive years. Both of them knew what the TV ratings were. They, they talked about four, yeah. five, and I mean, it was like, they sounded like programmers. Oh yeah. I think they're well aware. I mean, they know that, that when you're the guy who's the caretaker of the program, that you are responsible for keeping the standard. Yeah. And we hear that phrase, you know, the standard tossed around a lot. Well, Caroline Duke are the standard. Yeah. They're the standard in this deal. And, you know, the my my buddy Mark Packer used to say on the show, when Duke and Carolina are good, the rest of the league is good. And he's right. I mean, and we're we're headed for another one here in a couple of weeks because it could very well determine who wins the regular season in the ACC and who has top seed in the tournament and who potentially could be on the one line the following Sunday. Yeah. They, they both talked about the fact that they did not have to motivate their teams, their players to play each other. Right. Uh, but Krzyzewski had an explanation for that. I thought he said that the teams had the best ingredients, the best talent, the best coaches, the best preparation. And then he said, if the officials don't screw it up, it's going to be a great game. Mm -hmm. He's right. Yeah. He, he was, I, I thought that was pretty funny when he said that back part, because, and again, this goes back to like, you know, even finding out that, you know, the, the secret Duke Carolina pickup games in the summer, you know, where Carolina players go over to Cameron and play and Duke players come over to Carolina to play. And then, um, you know, NC State guys sometimes, according to John Henson here recently, want to know why they don't get included. You know, and it's – but I think it's now become a much more homogenized group of players. But nonetheless, I, I think the the competitive nature of the programs brings out the best in each other. And I'll go back to what I said earlier. I think that's why Duke and Caroline need each other. Oh, yeah. I think they – I think the – I think the rivalry is the rivalry in part because of what these two programs are and, and they tend to deliver and they've got the great stories and the great players and the great coaches. And now that you have two former players coaching the respective schools, I think we've even just, you know, we've kind of even thrown it up the chain even a little bit more too. And I, that's a pretty special part of this in my mind as well. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The, uh, you, you, you asked them about um, the player that they might like to have. And yeah. I, 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 re I respect you know, the confidence that you're sharing with them. But there was one question as a Carolina guy, which <laughs> I am, that, uh, that wasn't asked unless it was on the cutting room floor. Coach K and, and um, of course, so did Roy, talked about recruiting character. Mm -hmm. Not characters, but character. And I thought about that when the image came to my mind of uh, Christian Leitner and uh, uh, Gr Grayson. I mean, th there were incidents that Carolina seemed to be on the receiving end that did not make it onto the show. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. Leitner's veracity as a player, um, Allen certainly had the veracity as a player. Uh, you know, I think the competitive piece of that boiled over in the case of Allen. Yeah. Um, I think Leitner was just a, you know, hell bet for broke guy. <laughs> um, and still to, to this day is regarded as, and I, and I would equate it this way. Okay. And then here again, grew up a Carolina fan, but an outsider now to this operation and watching it from afar, I think Tyler Hansbro is Carolina's Christian Leitner. Could be. I, be. Because he epitomized the physicality, the hell-bent for broke to win, the national champion, the national player of the year candidate, the guy who, when he walked in, might have been the most hated guy in the, in the opposing guy's building, right? Yeah. And I think, I think he embraced it much like Leitner embraced it. In fact, I've talked to Tyler a little bit about, you know, now he's gotten into the media business a little bit and he's doing some stuff online and, you know, he's gotten after Kentucky a lot because he says, you know, Kentucky's program's a little overrated and the Kentucky people are all I am. I said, I think you're saying it for effect. I really do. I think you're, I think you're, you know, you're, there's a, there's a term we use in media. He's Don King in it. He's promoting the fight, uh -huh. um, you know? And so I, I think that, 
that Leitner was that guy for Mike. I think Hansborough was that guy for Roy to a degree. But I would also say, too, I didn't want to, in the interest of the peace, Larry, I wanted to see if we could keep the wires to quote Ghostbusters. I didn't want to cross the wires. Yeah. I want well, to I see. It. It. Yeah. 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 And, and so therefore the competitive nature about recruiting and the character piece, I thought the story Tori Roy told about going into the kid's house and the relationship with the parents was fascinating. I All think right. that's it. Yeah. And I think Mike also said, Hey, look, we got to have a really good structure we got to figure out what the structure is on these guys that we bring into the program. But you're right. Character and characters sometimes gets a little gray. I, I the, uh, the player uh, whose home Roy was in and he left because of comments that the player made to his mother. Right. Uh, I can't reveal the name of the player because Roy didn't say who it was. I just right. wonder if, if you know who he was talking about. I do not. I do not know the player. And it's one of those things that I just like the story enough that yeah. I kind of want that I kind of want that mystery to linger. Oh, absolutely. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But, but I, I'll tell you this, somebody's gonna watch this show and go, Oh, I know who that player was. <laughs> and who knows, maybe we'll find out as a result of the show. That would be kind of interesting if we did. It would create a lot of online chatter. Mm. Yeah. Message boards will have fun with that. Yeah, that wouldn't be bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't be bad for viewership. The uh, I there was a very sweet moment when the mm. two were talking about their mothers, yeah, and it was a softer side of Coach K and Roy Williams. Yep, it, it was really quite nice. Yeah, I I think too that we were fortunate to have two guys lead these programs, and you can certainly roll Coach Smith into this part of the conversation as well, who understood the family value and the work ethic of in Roy's case, his mom. And in Mike's case, his mom and dad and the influence of both of their mothers in particular, as you said, uh, I think Mike has shown that because of how he honors his mother now with all the things that he has set up through not only their foundation, but also what Duke university does in, in her name. Uh, the Emily K center is a phenomenal civic organization and, um, just, to you know, the work they do is, is admirable. And I think Roy has done it by just telling you the stories of how hard his mom worked, the work ethic she instilled in Roy. I mean, look, I, I first met coach Williams when he was currying the television show across the state from my dad. That's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would go on Saturday nights with my dad to tape coach crumbs football television show as a kid. I think I did it only because I knew there'd be free Cokes at the television station, but nonetheless, it was, I, I learned a lot. I mean, I learned a lot and watched the show happen. And then I started holding a stopwatch and I guess in some small way, it got me into this business. But, um, I remember coach Williams coming by and picking up the tapes and putting them in his car and starting to drive West to drop them in Greensboro and then to drop it Nashville and stay with his mom and, and that kind of thing. But I, um, I think that that power was real. I do. And I think they both, I think they both kind of honor their moms with their careers and now with their postscripts in their careers. You asked a great question. I, I thought truly uh, when you said, what is the difference between a great team and a championship mm. team? I thought they had very interesting answers. Yeah. I can't take credit for that one. That was one we kind of put together um, collaboratively in our discussions because we had to find a way, again, if you go down the rabbit hole in one hour of players, you're going to end up, you know, just going all over the place, right? Um, so in order to kind of keep the process moving, we elected to go great team to championship team. And I thought the answers in the examples, and I thought Mike pointing out that Marcus Page's shot against Villanova had gotten lost in all of this, mm -hmm. right? Um as much as, you know, he's maybe remembered for Grant Hill to Christian Leitner to beat Kentucky, he recognizes how lucky you have to be. One play, one basket, one bounce, one game, right? Yeah. And I think they both know championships, they are earned, they can be built, but the difference in a great team and a championship team can often be just one play. And um, 
I mean, and you go back and think about it. And I spent some time. I uh, <laughs> essentially the day we taped this, I then went to Stanley County. I was asked by the Stanley County Sports Hall of Fame to to be a speaker at their Hall of Fame induction. So I went from Roy Williams and Mike Shashevsky to my dad's hometown to speak to peers and people that, you know, he kind of grew up in that area in Albemarle. Yeah. And then I drove back to Atlanta that night. And I spent a lot of time driving that night thinking about, Larry, the number of great teams that I had seen that didn't win championships and why they didn't win them. I mean, I remember the night Roy lost as Kansas's coach to Arizona and Birmingham and could barely do the press conference because he loved that team so much. I know how bad he felt that night they lost in Houston because I was doing the Turner uh, teams cast with uh, Brendan Hayward. Mike Krzyzewski, when they lost in Lexington that night um, at Rupp Arena, and I'm drawing a blank who they lost to, when they lost that game that night, Duke thought they were going to win the national championship and they lost in the Sweet 16. That's the moment. That's why this event that's coming up next month is so great is because it it is pulled with you from a flash and it's gone. It could be a shot. It could be a game. It could be whatever the transportation. Is. And I think both recognize how lucky you have to be to win a national championship. And it shouldn't distinguish what happens, but it does. And it's unfair. And I thought Roy said, as much success as you can have, he's never felt more inadequate than he did in that locker room in Houston after they lost to Villanova. Yeah. And I think every coach in that room related to that. Those There were five or six statements in the whole hour and change that I think it touched all those coaches in attendance. And that part in particular, I think, was one that hit home. And I didn't look into the audience. It was hard to see with the way we lit the project. Yeah. But afterwards, I had two or three tell me just what that comment meant to them. I thought Mike's comment, uh, our game is cruel. That's the beauty of it because only one team wins. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, <laughs> look, they're Carolina fans who, I mean, look, I'll, I'll go back to 1977. What would you have paid? Well, hell, we can go back further than that. I mean, if Tommy Lagarde doesn't get hurt in 1977, Carolina wins the national championship. If Walter Davis doesn't break his fingers against Virginia or in the semifinals ahead of the Virginia game in the finals, Carolina probably wins the national championship. If Phil Ford doesn't hyperextend his elbow in the uh, Notre Dame game, right? Carolina probably wins the national championship. And they still got to the game with all that. And, you know... My dad, God bless him, if he said, uh, well, you know, Bruce Buckley's shot might have been goaltending against Marquette. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, it might have been. Okay, but all those things right there are maybe the differentials in winning and not winning the national championship. So I, I think that part of it's fascinating for sure. Absolutely. You, towards the end of the broadcast, you got into uh, the state of college basketball. And yep. because of who they are, their opinions – matter a lot mm -hmm. and I think those opinions need to continue to evolve and I, I asked that question out of an encouragement piece as much as I did of anything else because I wanted people to understand not those in attendance as much as those would be watching Larry yeah of what Mike Krzyzewski and Roy Williams feel compelled to talk about now that they're not coaching and I thought the analogy coach K gave of real estate in California was pretty impactful um, and I agree with him. I am as concerned right now about college basketball as I am about anything going on in college athletics. Uh, I think that the organizational structure of the NCAA is to be questioned. I think the, the commitment level of these universities right now is not sustainable, be it through budgeting of resources for you know facilities or the name, image, and likeness concept. Um, and I've got some pretty strong opinions about Dr. Emmerich's tenure as the president of the NCAA, uh, having worked on a campus and part of that tenure and now seen the effects of it post script. I think it's, it's a pretty dangerous thing that happened, but I, I do believe Mike Krzyzewski and Roy Williams are two voices. And I would add that when he retires from Michigan state, Tom Izzo will be another. And again, I'll go back to my fortunate uh, status this winter to ride around with Jim Beheim and do games and Jim Beheim is one of those guys who sees a sense of responsibility to make sure college basketball 
is kept in the right perspective, and he's concerned about it. And I'll, I'll say this, Jim is not happy at all about last week's decision not to have 18 teams play in the ACC tournament. He yeah. is. He thinks that is a damaging piece to where uh, to where the ACC stands in relationship to the quality of the program because when you miss the tournament, he thinks that's an, that is a huge negative that your program then has to overcome in recruiting to get yeah. back for the next year. So I think Mike and Roy take that seriously. I think Mike will probably be, in my opinion, more on the forefront publicly than Roy will. But as I said in the uh, in the piece, last summer I was aware that Coach Williams had been counseled by uh, a lot of athletic directors, a lot of commissioners, other coaches, and I think he is a he's an important voice into where college basketball can go. And I think that is a that is a real piece of their contribution to uh, to what is uh, still a, a Roy, very part of college basketball. Roy used the term chaos. He said college basketball is in chaos and. And, and and Coach K, as you pointed out, has a long history of concern about the game. Yeah, I think we're all – I look, the relationship between college basketball and the National Basketball Association has been tricky. We're all, we all agree with that, right? Uh, the NBA likes the relationship they have with college basketball because it's a farm system for them. Yeah. I mean, it is – look, you, the player can – player doesn't have to go to college. He can now bypass college. Uh, he can jump on and do something else. I mean, he can go one year and semester and a half and go. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. We now have players who, quite frankly, I mean, Armando Baycott has stayed in part because of the financial gain he can have by staying rather than seek professional basketball. Yeah. Uh, my son spent the last two years at Clemson as a graduate assistant uh, manager to uh, Brad Brownell and and he told me of the landscape involving in college basketball and and how the portal works and some of the things he's seen and ironically he now works with a collective at Georgia Tech and you know it's amazing yeah. um and it is chaos and trust me if you need any further example of what the chaos looks like look at the University of Arizona i mean the University of Arizona's landscape the story today is just amazing how much money they're going to pay all these people to not work or to work and Yet they had a two hundred and forty odd million dollar budget error. So I think it's I think it's a really tricky time for a lot of institutions. And I am concerned deeply about college basketball because I think it's it's kind of declined a little bit in the in the public light of what we consider in American sports. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm very old school on this, as my uh, son uh, my son points out. He's uh, uh, he worked at Sports Illustrated and uh, now works at Sports Business Journal. Mm. Uh, has a, a a very positive perspective on what I would agree is chaotic. Um, so I guess you you and I uh, perhaps share a concern. Well, I want to. I just want to talk to your son about being in the son of somebody club. That's all I want to <laughs> talk about. Man, we got a lot of guests. We got a lot of members driving that bus right now. That's good. <laughs> the um, you concluded the program with. Uh, their post-career lives. And, and as you pointed out earlier, um, Roy seems more inclined to attend games than does uh, yeah. Mike. Roy, Roy made a statement that, I, that clarified, really, for me. He said that he did not leave coaching because of NIL and, and transfers and, and all of that. Uh, he just he said that uh, he felt he couldn't do it anymore. He said, yeah. I stopped because I wasn't getting it done and I couldn't handle that. Wow. Yeah. yeah I, look, I think everybody gets there. Um, I would tell you that I think Jim Beheim was kind of the same way in in my in my visits with him and doing games with him. I, I think there are guys who saw the generational change in the student athlete and in today's modern college athlete, and the messages that they grew up with. Uh, you know, with Bayheim, it was Fred Lewis. With uh, with Roy, it was probably most mostly Coach Smith, right? Um, with Mike, it was probably a combination of Coach Knight and and others. And I I think there are times where the mental fatigue of trying to build what you have come to expect as your standard becomes frustrating, and you're not sure you want to line up and go anymore. I I would say this too. I think. Nick Saban probably looks at it the same way today as Mike Shashevsky and, and Roy Williams. Oh. Um, you know, look, I've, I've spent 
uh, I have had Miami for one game this year. And Jim Laranega is a guy who I have great respect for. He's coached a lot of places and done it well for a long time, as you know. And Jim Laranega looks like one of those guys who's like, man, I'm not sure I'm reaching this group. Yeah. And it's, it's hard. I, I look, it's a, it's a young man's game in terms of the ability to understand all the different things going on. I, but I don't know that necessarily I agree with coach Williams. It's his statement and I honor that, but there are a lot of things around basketball that happened during the pandemic that I think contributed to a lot of these guys ultimately making a decision. It may not be the exclusive reason or the sole reason, but I certainly think it played it. Maybe it's a smaller piece of the pie than what we're typically saying. Yeah. The, um, you brought at the end of the broadcast, you brought it back to the beginning, which is where you were, what the event was. Mm -hmm. And I I thought that uh, both Roy and, and Mike had very good comments, statements to the coaches who were the audience. Yeah. I, I think both realized the importance of why they were there. We tried to keep it on, you know, intermittently through not only talking about their successes, but also the leadership aspects of what they did as coaches. And I think at the end, they, they both channeled the message of impacting those communities and those young people. Um, both, I think, used the term, if I remember correctly, changing lives. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that Roy remembers Buddy Baldwin's impact. Mike certainly remembers his high school coach's impact. Um you know, and I, I think they want to – the core is still the core of the whole deal, right? Those coaches, I mean, you know, my dad um, idolized his high school football coach in Albemarle, who was a Carolina grad named Toby Webb. And he would do anything for Coach Webb. That loyalty he had for Coach Webb fell to me from my high school basketball coach, who was once the chair of the math department at NC State until he retired a couple of years ago. I didn't play on a championship team like my dad did in Western North Carolina. Or I didn't play for Roy Williams or Mike Krzyzewski, but John Griggs was important to my career. It still is. Yeah. I think they realize because of what happened to them, Larry, in their careers, how important that role of the high school coach is as they sit there. And they want to sure you want to win, right? But the life values are still the same. That part does not change in this industry. That's the unique part about coaching. Um you know, I've gotten to know a lot of really successful coaches now in the work I do. And when you get them away from the day to day or week to week grind of the season and you're playing golf with them, they all come back to the core element of team building, impacting lives. And if you can be successful on the field or on the floor, it ultimately helps you be successful in habits you build. Um, you know, one of the best young basketball coaches in the country is somebody that my son worked for for two years at Kennesaw State named Amir Abdur Rahim, who's now at the University of South Florida. He's got a winning streak in the American. It's his first year. He told my son something that he learned from Billy Kennedy, who was at Texas A&M, who Amir played for at Southeast Louisiana. And it's funny because I got into a conversation with Roy about this last weekend. We were talking about Amir, and I said, well, Amir bases his entire program on something Billy Kennedy talked to him about daily habits. And he said, huh, sounds like Coach Smith. There you go. Yeah. They yeah. all they all treat it dynamically the same. And it, I guess success is the counter to that in some ways. Um, Roy said the influence to change somebody on the rest of their lives is the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. And, and, and Mike said, you have a great responsibility. Your wins will be how you develop those young men and women. You have the honor to coach. Right. So that was, uh, I thought that was a very positive, uplifting way to look at it. Yeah, it's uh, phenomenal. Last question. As a okay. Georgia Tech guy, what was Coach K referring to with his comment about Bobby Crimmins? Uh oh, I broke him up. <laughs> we don't. Well, let me just say this: I only worked with Bobby for five years. It only felt like twenty. Um, <laughs> Crimmins, Crimmins. Uh, I mean, good heavens! This is a whole other show, David. I'll have to come back and tell Crimmins stories. Um, I actually came to New York to work the uh, 
to do the Georgia Tech alumni event in New York City one time with Cremens. And I spoke for five and Bobby spoke for an hour and five um, <laughs> and just rambled about all hollows in the Bronx and everything else. Um, I, Bobby Crimmins is a, an American original born on the 4th of July to boot. And I knew Mike was going to, you know, kind of pull the chain on Crimmins at some point during the day. Cause Crimmins and Mike came into the league at the same time. And he and Valvano and Crimmins, you know, as Bobby likes to say, Wes, we called ourselves the young guns. And I said, yeah, Bobby, <laughs> but those other two guys won national titles and you recruited players. So there we go. <laughs> um, but no, I, I knew he was going to pull the chain. Cremens is uh, a little, um, Bobby can be a little forgetful at times. So yeah. let's just put it that way. And there's a moment in Carolina history that is a tough moment. And it's Dennis Scott's three to beat Georgia, beat Carolina and Alexander Coliseum. And Bobby has no idea they won the game. I'm just going to tell you that part. <laughs> the, the comeback where I think it was what Scott Williams, Dragon, help me here. Scott Williams, Kevin Madden, they threw the ball away, right? Something like that. And next thing you know, missed free throw. Oh, no, they, they deliberately missed the free throw. Yeah. Right. Deliberately missed the free throw. Oh, rebounded ball, got out to Dennis Scott. Next thing you know, Scott hits a three. Bobby looks at George Felton <laughs> and George goes, Bobby, we just won the game. We did. That's literally what happened. <laughs> Where's this Bobby, Bobby denies it, by the way, for the record, Bobby denies it. We went to Scotland. Or we went to Ireland together to play golf in 2008. I finally got him. I said, Bobby, you had no damn idea you won the game. You're right. I didn't. So there we go. <laughs> Wes, this was terrific. It really was. My Thank pleasure. You. An honor to visit with you, Larry. I uh, I remember when we met for the first time. I was a lot younger. Um, <laughs> we all but, were. <laughs> yeah, well, but I was with my dad, and I remember meeting you in Chapel Hill at Carmichael when I was a kid. So this is uh, – this is really special. I, I was when I heard you were involved in this. It was a it's a real treat to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, David. Over to you. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. I want to thank Wes Durham, Larry Keith for a really highly engaged engaging session. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon and have an enjo enjoyable remainder of your day. Thanks, David. Thank you all very much. Be well. Thank, thank you, Dragon.